Tuck Everlasting, Chapters 3 through 5. Chapter 3 At noon of that same day in the first week of August, Winnie Foster sat on the bristly grass just inside the fence and said to the large toad who was squatting a few yards away across the road, I will, though. You'll see. Maybe even first thing tomorrow, while everyone's still asleep. It was hard to know whether the toad was listening or not. Certainly, Winnie had given it good reason to ignore her. She had come out to the fence, very cross, very near the boiling point on a day that was itself near to boiling, and had noticed the toad at once. It was the only living thing in sight except for a stationary cloud of hysterical gnats suspended in the heat above the road. When he had found some pebbles at the base of the fence and, for lack of any other way to show how she felt, had flung one at the toad. It missed altogether, as she'd fully intended it should, but she made a game of it anyway, tossing pebbles at such an angle that they passed through the gnat cloud on their way to the toad. The gnats were too frantic to notice these intrusions, however, and since every pebble missed its final mark, the toad continued to squat and grimace without so much as a twitch. Possibly it felt resentful, or perhaps it was only asleep. In either case, it gave her not a glance when at last she ran out of pebbles and sat down to tell it her troubles. Look here, toad, she said, thrusting her arms through the bars of the fence and plucking at the weeds on the other side. I don't think I can stand it much longer. At this moment, a window at the front of the cottage was flung open, and a thin voice, her grandmother's, piped, Winifred, don't sit on that dirty grass. You'll stain your boots and stockings. And another, firmer voice, her mother's, added, Come in now, Winnie, right away. You'll get heat stroke out there on a day like this, and your lunch is ready. See, said Winnie to the toad, that's just what I mean. It's like that every minute. If I had a sister or a brother, there'd be someone else for them to watch. But as it is, there's only me. I'm tired of being looked at all the time. I want to be by myself for a change. She leaned her forehead against the bars and after a short silence went on in a thoughtful tone. I'm not exactly sure what I'd do, you know, but something interesting. Something that's all mine. Something that would make some kind of difference in the world. It'd be nice to have a new name. To start with, one that's not all worn out from being called so much. And I might even decide to have a pet. Maybe a big old toad like you that I could keep in a nice cage with lots of grass and... At this, the toad stirred and blinked. It gave a heave of muscle and plopped its heavy mud ball of a body a few inches farther away from her. I suppose you're right, said Winnie. Then you'd be just the way I am now. Why should you have to be cooped up in a cage, too? It'd be better if I could be like you, out in the open and making up my own mind. Do you know they've hardly ever let me out of this yard all by myself? I'll never be able to do anything important if I stay in here like this. I expect I'd better run away. She paused and peered anxiously at the toad to see how it would receive this staggering idea but it showed no signs of interest. You think I wouldn't dare, don't you? She said accusingly. I will, though. You'll see. Maybe even first thing in the morning, while everyone's still asleep. Winnie, came the firm voice from the window. All right, I'm coming, she cried, exasperated, and then added quickly, I mean, I'll be right there, Mama. She stood up, brushing at her legs, where bits of itchy grass clung to her stockings. The toad, as if it saw that their interview was over, stirred again, bunched up, and bounced itself clumsily off toward the wood. Winnie watched it go. Hop away, toad, she called after it. You'll see. Just wait till morning. Chapter 4 At sunset of that same long day, a stranger came strolling up the road from the village and paused at the foster's gate. Winnie was once again in the yard, this time intent on catching fireflies, and at first she didn't notice him. But after a few moments of watching her, he called out, Good evening. He was remarkably tall and narrow, this stranger standing there. 
His long face faded off into a thin, apologetic beard, but his suit was a jaunty yellow that seemed to glow a little in the fading light. A black hat dangled from one hand, and as when he came toward him, he passed the other through his dry, gray hair, settling it smoothly. "'Well, now,' he said in a light voice, "'out for fireflies, are you?' "'Yes,' said Winnie. "'A lovely thing to do on a summer evening,' said the man richly. "'A lovely entertainment. "'I used to do it myself when I was your age. "'But, of course, that was a long, long time ago.' "'He laughed, gesturing in self-deprecation with long, thin fingers. "'His tall body moved continuously. "'A foot tapped, a shoulder twitched, "'and it moved in angles, rather jerkily. "'But at the same time he had a kind of grace.' like a well-handled marionette. Indeed, he seemed almost to hang suspended there in the twilight. But Winnie, though she was half-charmed, was suddenly reminded of the stiff black ribbons they had hung on the door of the cottage for her grandfather's funeral. She frowned and looked at the man more closely. But his smile seemed perfectly all right, quite agreeable and friendly. "'Is this your house?' asked the man, folding his arms now and leaning against the gate. Yes, said Winnie. Do you want to see my father? Perhaps, in a bit, said the man. But I'd like to talk to you first. Have you and your family lived here long? Oh, yes, said Winnie. We've lived here forever. Forever, the man echoed thoughtfully. It was not a question, but Winnie decided to explain anyway. Well, not forever, of course, but as long as there's been any people here. My grandmother was born here. She says this was all trees once, just one big forest everywhere around. But it's mostly all cut down now, except for the wood. I see, said the man, pulling at his beard. So, of course, you know everyone and everything that goes on. Well, not especially, said Winnie. At least I don't. Why? The man lifted his eyebrows. Oh, he said, I'm looking for someone, a family. I don't know anybody much, said Winnie with a shrug, but my father might. You could ask him. I believe I shall, said the man. I do believe I shall. At this moment, the cottage door opened, and in the lamp glow that spilled across the grass, Winnie's grandmother appeared. Winifred, who are you talking to out there? It's a man, Granny, she called back. He says he's looking for someone. What's that? said the old woman. She picked up her skirts and came down the path to the gate. What did you say he wants? The man on the other side of the fence bowed slightly. Good evening, madam, he said. How delightful to see you looking so fit. And why shouldn't I be fit? she retorted, peering at him through the fading light. His yellow suit seemed to surprise her, and she squinted suspiciously. We haven't met, that I recall. Who are you? Who are you looking for? The man answered neither of these questions. Instead, he said, This young lady tells me you've lived here for a long time, and so I thought you probably know everyone who comes and goes. The old woman shook her head. I don't know everyone, she said, nor do I want to, and I don't stand outside in the dark discussing such a thing with strangers. Neither does Winifred. So, and then she paused, for through the twilight sounds of crickets and sighing trees, a faint, surprising wisp of music came floating to them, and all three turned toward it, toward the wood. It was a tinkling little melody, and in a few moments it stopped. My stars, said Winnie's grandmother, her eyes round. I do believe it's come again, after all these years. She pressed her wrinkled hands together, forgetting the man in the yellow suit. Did you hear that, Winifred? That's it. That's the elf music I told you about. Why, it's been ages since I heard it last, and this is the first time you've heard it, isn't it? Wait till we tell your father. And she seized Winnie's hand and turned to go back into the cottage. Wait, said the man at the gate. He had stiffened, and his voice was eager. You've heard that music before, you say. 
But before he could get an answer, it began again, and they all stopped to listen. This time it tinkled its way faintly through the little melody three times before it faded. It sounds like a music box, said Winnie when it was over. Nonsense! It's elves, crowed her grandmother excitedly. And then she said to the man in the gate, you'll have to excuse us now. She shook the gate latch under his nose to make sure it was locked. And then, taking Winnie by the hand once more, she marched up the path into the cottage, shutting the door firmly behind her. But the man in the yellow suit stood tapping his foot in the road for a long time all alone, looking at the wood. The last stains of sunset had melted away, and the twilight died too as he stood there, though its remnants clung reluctantly to everything that was pale in color, pebbles, the dusty road, the figure of the man himself, turning them blue and blurry. Then the moon rose. The man came to himself and sighed. His expression was one of intense satisfaction. He put on his hat, and in the moonlight his long fingers were graceful and very white. Then he turned and disappeared down the shadowy road, and as he went he whistled, very softly, the tinkling little melody from the wood. Chapter 5 Winnie woke early next morning. The sun was only just opening its own eye on the eastern horizon, and the cottage was full of silence. But she realized that sometime during the night she had made up her mind. She would not run away today. Where would I go anyway, she asked herself. There's nowhere else I really want to be. But in another part of her head, the dark part where her oldest fears were housed, she knew there was another sort of reason for staying at home. She was afraid to go away alone. It was one thing to talk about being by yourself, doing important things, but quite another when the opportunity arose. The characters in the story she read always seemed to go off without a thought or care. But in real life, well, the world was a dangerous place. People were always telling her so, and she would not be able to manage without protection. They were always telling her that, too. No one ever said precisely what it was that she would not be able to manage, but she did not need to ask. Her own imagination supplied the horrors. Still, it was galling, this having to admit she was afraid. And when she remembered the toad, she felt even more disheartened. What if the toad should be out by the fence again today? What if he should laugh at her secretly and think she was a coward? Well, anyway, she could at least slip out right now, she decided, and go into the wood to see if she could discover what had really made the music the night before. That would be something, anyway. She did not allow herself to consider the idea that making a difference in the world might require a bolder venture. She merely told herself consolingly, Of course, while I'm in the wood, if I decide never to come back, well then, that will be that. She was able to believe in this because she needed to, and believing was her own true promising friend once more. It was another heavy morning, already hot and breathless, but in the wood the air was cooler and smelled agreeably damp. Why, it's nice, she thought with great surprise, for the wood was full of light, entirely different from the light she was used to. It was green and amber and alive, quivering in splotches on the padded ground, fanning into sturdy stripes between the tree trunks. There were little flowers she did not recognize, white and palest blue, and endless tangled vines, and here and there a fallen log, half rotted but soft with patches of sweet green velvet moss. And there were creatures everywhere. The air fairly hummed with their daybreak activity, Beetles and birds and squirrels and ants and countless other things unseen, all gentle and self-absorbed and not in the least alarming. There was even, she saw with satisfaction, the toad. It was squatting on a low stump and she might not have noticed it, for it looked more like a mushroom than a living creature sitting there. As she came abreast of it, however, it blinked and the movement gave it away. See, she exclaimed, I told you I'd be here first thing in the morning. The toad blinked again and nodded, or perhaps it was only swallowing a fly, 
but then it nudged itself off the edge of the stump and vanished in the underbrush. It must have been waiting for me, said Winnie to herself, and was very glad she had come. She wandered for a long time, looking at everything, listening to everything, proud to, proud to forget the tight, pruned world outside, humming a little now, trying to remember the pattern of the melody she had heard the night before. And then up ahead, in a place where the light seemed brighter and the ground somewhat more open, something moved. Winnie stopped abruptly and crouched down. If it's really elves, she thought, I can have a look at them. And, though her instinct was to turn and run, she was pleased to discover that her curiosity was stronger. She began to creep forward. She would go just close enough, she told herself, just close enough to see, and then she would turn and run. But when she came near, up behind a sheltering tree trunk, and peered around it, her mouth dropped open, and all thought of running melted away. There was a clearing directly in front of her, at the center of which an enormous tree thrust up, its thick roots rumpling the ground ten feet around in every direction. Sitting relaxed with his back against the trunk was a boy, almost a man, and he seemed so glorious to Winnie that she lost her heart at once. He was thin and sunburned, this wonderful boy, with a thick mop of curly brown hair, and he wore his battered trousers and loose grubby shirt with as much self-assurance as if they were silk and satin. A pair of green suspenders, more decorative than useful, gave the finishing touch, for he was shoeless, and there was a twig tucked between the toes of one foot. He waved the twig idly as he sat there, his face turned up to gaze at the branches far above him. The golden morning light seemed to glow all around him, while brighter patches fell, now on his lean brown hands, now on his hair and face, as the leaves stirred over his head. Then he rubbed an ear carelessly, yawned and stretched. Shifting his position, he turned his attention to a little pile of pebbles next to him. As when he watched, scarcely breathing, he moved the pile carefully to one side, pebble by pebble. Beneath the pile, the ground was shiny wet. The boy lifted a final stone, and when he saw a low spurt of water, arching up and returning like a fountain into the ground. He bent and put his lips to the spurt, drinking noiselessly, and then he sat up again and drew his shirt sleeve across his mouth. As he did this, he turned his face in her direction, and their eyes met. For a long moment, they looked at each other in silence, the boy with his arm still raised to his mouth. Neither of them moved. At last, his arm fell to his side. You may as well come out, he said with a frown. When he stood up, embarrassed and, because of that, resentful. I didn't mean to watch you, she protested as she stepped into the clearing. I didn't know anyone would be here. The boy eyed her as she came forward. What are you doing here? He asked her sternly. It's my wood, said Winnie, surprised by the question. I can come here whenever I want to. At least I was never here before, but I could have come any time. Oh, said the boy, relaxing a little. You're one of the Fosters, then. I'm Winnie, she said. Who are you? I'm Jessie Tuck, he answered. How do? And he put out a hand. When he took his hand, staring at him, he was even more beautiful up close. Do you live nearby, she managed at last, letting go of his hand reluctantly. I never saw you before. Do you come here a lot? No one's supposed to. It's our wood. Then she added quickly, it's all right, though, if you come here. I mean, it's all right with me. The boy grinned. No, I don't live nearby, and no, I don't come here often. Just passing through, and thanks. I'm glad it's all right with you. That's good, said Winnie irrelevantly. She stepped back and sat down primly a short distance from him. How old are you, anyway? she asked, squinting at him. There was a pause. At last, he said, Why do you want to know? I just wondered, said Winnie. All right, I'm 104 years old, 
he told her solemnly. No, I mean really, she persisted. Well then, he said, if you must know, I'm seventeen. Seventeen? That's right. Ugh, said Winnie hopelessly. Seventeen? That's old. You have no idea, he agreed with a nod. Winnie had the feeling he was laughing at her, but decided it was a nice kind of laughing. Are you married? she asked next. This time he laughed out loud. No, I'm not married. Are you? Now it was Winnie's turn to laugh. Of course not, she said. I'm only ten, but I'll be eleven pretty soon. And then you'll get married, he suggested. Winnie laughed again, her head on one side, admiring him. And then she pointed to the spurt of water. Is that good to drink, she asked. I'm thirsty. Jesse Tuck's face was instantly serious. Oh, that, no, no, it's not, he said quickly. You mustn't drink from it. Comes right up out of the ground, probably pretty dirty. And he began to pile the pebbles over it again. But you drank some, Winnie reminded him. Oh, did you see that? He asked her anxiously. Well, me, I'll drink anything. I mean, I'm used to it. It wouldn't be good for you, though. Why not, said Winnie. She stood up. It's mine anyway, if it's in the wood. I want some. I'm about as dry as dust. And she went to where he sat and knelt down beside the pile of pebbles. Believe me, Winnie Foster, said Jessie. It would be terrible for you if you drank any of this water. Just terrible. I can't let you. Well, I don't see why not, said Winnie plaintively. I'm getting thirstier every minute. If it didn't hurt you, it won't hurt me. If my papa was here, he'd let me have some. You're not going to tell him about it, are you? said Jesse. His face had gone very pale under his sunburn. He stood up and put a bare foot firmly on the pile of pebbles. I knew this would happen sooner or later. Now what am I going to do? As he said this, there was a crashing sound among the trees, and a voice called, Jesse? Thank goodness, said Jesse, blowing out his cheeks in relief. Here comes Ma and Miles. They'll know what to do. And sure enough, a big, comfortable-looking woman appeared, leaning a fat old horse, and at her side was a young man almost as beautiful as Jesse. It was May Tuck with her other son, Jesse's older brother. And at once, when she saw the two of them, Jesse with his foot on the pile of pebbles and Winnie on her knees beside him, she seemed to understand. Her hand flew to her bosom, grasping at the old brooch that fastened her shawl, and her face went bleak. Well, boys, she said, here it is. The worst is happening at last. <laughs>